Last week we joined with John, who uh, remembers the, the, in the feeding of the 5,000, this event that all four Gospels remember and tell the story of. We have this moment where John remembers the small boy. And we focused on that, that very close uh, moment there, that moment between when the boy gives up his lunch and he has nothing, and when something then happens, that moment when his faith is stretched. This week, we, we zoom out to, to take a far bigger uh, scope of, of what's happening here. And we do this with Mark. The Gospel of Mark is written in such a sparse and, and simple style that um, he covers a lot of ground very quickly. And so as you're reading Mark, it's, it's easy to get the bigger picture. And also, he does this thing that's almost cinematic. Um, you know how you watch some of the more modern movies, they cut scenes really fast, cut back and forth. That's what Mark does. It's called a Mark in the Sandwich, when he goes from one scene to another scene and cuts back to the first one to, to continue the story. He starts a story, he cuts to something else, and then he comes back to finish it. It, it keeps uh, you interested, it keeps the narrative moving, and, and that's what he does here. What we have here are three scenes. We, we're starting with uh, the beginning of chapter 6, and we'll cover what we just looked at in Scripture. What we have in this first scene, as you, you sort of imagine uh, the movie beginning, the, the credits have rolled, and uh, if you can see, on the, what you see on the screen is Jesus sitting with his disciples, and he's about to send them out. He's commissioning them to go out two by two to do what he's been doing. As people who follow a rabbi, these uh, disciples, they seek to do everything the rabbi has been doing. And so the next step for them, they've watched Jesus uh, call people to repent, they've watched Jesus preach, they've watched Jesus heal, now they are going to go out and do the same. And th so we, we look at this moment, we watch Jesus give these last instructions to tell them, you know, go to one house and stay there, don't start bopping around to a bunch of houses in one town for people to start competing to see who can be more extravagant in housing you. That won't help. He tells them, don't bring a lot of stuff. You are your equipment. You are your equipment. You don't need stuff. You just need you. And don't get bogged down in failure. Right? If, if it doesn't work, go to the edge of town, knock the, dirt off the, your, the dust off your feet, and take off. Don't beat yourself up. Don't blame yourself. Don't dig in your heels. Just, just keep on going. Go to the next place. They've just seen Jesus do the same when he uh, did not have such a good run at his own hometown. And so now they're, they're going to go and do the same. And so the disciples are sent out to proclaim and to be good news. And if you can imagine a, a, a sort of a fade to black as the disciples go off into the rising sun. There's the, the birds are singing. There's dew on the grass. It's just this beautiful morning and they're going off and, and hope and expectation of what's about to happen. From this joyous and good and expected scene, uh, Mark then brings us to the next scene, which is as different as can be. We, we, we zoom in and we see uh, Herod in his feasting room, in his uh, dining room. It was probably twice the size of this room. Uh, cold uh, stone uh, Walls covered with, uh, sort of in Roman style, the big, uh, great uh, carpets, rug hangings, tapestries with gold woven into them. And in this very luxuriously appointed room, uh, there would have been long, low tables. And next to them, sort of chase lounge type chairs. It was the practice uh, when eating in those days. So you don't just sit at the table upright, you sort of lounge at the table. And, and so around these long, low tables would have been the cream of of, the, of society, the, the most important businessmen, the most important political leaders, the most important soldiers, all, all of the most important people of the whole region have gathered together, for Herod has called them together at, for this feast. And at this feast, if you can sort of imagine, like there's, there are servants all around the edge of, of the of the room waiting to run forward and fill up anyone's wine glass because this is what's called a symposio. It was this, this practice, probably where we get the modern term symposium, a little bit different meaning because at this setting it was a, a symposio, that Herod, this feast that Herod had gathered, it was expected that you were going to try to drink each other under the table. 
That was just how it worked. So you had all these uh, servants there ready to dash in and fill up your wine glass. For you, were, you would not have an empty wine glass. You had to keep up with, with uh, the guy next to you, drink for drink. And um, in front of these uh, fellows, the, these people who have had a few cups at this point, is, is the wreckage of, of a great feast that's like that only a, a king could pay for. And so in the middle of this, this uh, scene of, of luxury, of decadence, of drunkenness, Herod has this idea. It probably seemed like a good idea at the time. He thinks to himself, my daughter should dance for these fine fellows. And so he calls his daughter in and, and she dances. And uh, after the, the dance is over, he, she has entertained the guests. Everyone's clapping, wonderful daughter, Herod, all that. And uh, he says to his daughter, my daughter, whatever you want, you may have it, up to half my kingdom. And so she's excited, right? She's gonna have whatever she wants. You, can you imagine telling a teenage girl you can have whatever you want, up to half the kingdom? That, uh, so she goes out and she asks her mom what she should ask for. And this is when things go off the rails, when the party gets awkward, because Herodias, Herod's wife, had once been Herod's brother's wife. And, you know, I don't know, you just think of what that would be like. Think of marrying your brother's or your sibling's spouse. How, wouldn't that be a little bit awkward? Right? That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not a good idea, right? But this is what had been done. And uh, John the Baptist had pointed out that this isn't kosher. This is just not how it's supposed to be. And Herodias had, had been angry at this and, and had convinced her husband to lock up John the Baptist. And uh, her, Herod was fascinated with John in the way that those who are without scruples are fascinated by those who do have them, right? Herod is intrigued by John because John stands for what is right and pure, what is is holy, and Herod is kind of the, the worst case that you can get with a politician. He is the absolute, just the, the thing that you fear when you think of politician, someone who will cut throat, do whatever it takes, has no principles, has no uh, standards, just wants to stay in power, right? And so Herodias is uh, angry at John the Baptist. It's not enough to imprison him, and so she says to her, her daughter, go ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. A nice platter, if you will. And so the daughter goes in and does what her mama tells her. She had to have been a bit nervous. I mean, how, how many daughters have asked for the head of a, plat head of a man on a platter? And, but uh, that's what he, she asks, and Herod is now stuck. Because if he does it, he is breaking the law. If he doesn't do it, then he is uh, looking like a pushover in front of the most important people in his kingdom. If he does it, he is killing someone who is respected, someone he respects, and it will cause great fervor in the populace. If he doesn't do it, well, he said he gave his word, and if he's not a man of his word, right? And so he does it, right? He sends a soldier, John the Baptist is beheaded, and, uh, and brings the head back, and, and, and that, that's the picture. This is a scene that has been endlessly painted on the front of your bulletin is a picture of the daughter holding the head of John the Baptist being given it by her dad. I don't know why people enjoy painting that so much, but it has been painted many, many times. And so this, this scene of luxury, it, it sort of, as, as it ends, what I am, how I imagine Mark ending it, or what I see in my head is we've gone from this sort of raucous, joyous feast, and at the end you see the, the, the family, the host family, uh, re going, leaving the room for the night. The feast is ending, and I just want you to imagine that, that, that Herod and his wife are, are arm in arm, and Herod is furious but trying to cover it. Herodias is, is, is maniacally triumphant and does not care that her husband is angry. And, and there is the daughter whose eyes are very wide because now she has seen a man beheaded for the first time. It has to have been a cold, cold family gathering that next day when they uh, sat down for a meal, right? And so the, the, they, they walk out of the room, fade to black, and that is the second scene that Mark leaves us with. And then, we, now we, we go to the third scene that Mark gives us, going back to the continuation of, of where we began, because now it's three weeks later, and uh, 
I love it how they just tell you at the bottom of movies, three weeks later, and dot, 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 and, and it comes up, and, and there, there are the disciples coming over the horizon, and, and, and they're coming back to the meeting place. It could have been a month, it could have been two weeks, we don't know. But uh, it, they're coming back, and some of them are triumphant. Some of them have, have gone out and they have experienced what Jesus has told them, that they will cast out demons and heal people and people will come to them and there will be failure, but this is going to work, right? This is going to happen. And they're coming back triumphant because they have done as their master did and they are satisfied and they are tired and they're ready to sit down and to share this good news. And so some of the disciples are coming back like that. Some of the disciples, as they come over the horizon, they don't look triumphant because they have heard they have heard of John the Baptist, what happened to him. And so they're not coming back confident and proud. They're coming back looking over their shoulder. Because if John the Baptist could be suddenly killed, what could happen to them? Right. And so they're coming over the horizon, and they don't look like triumphant disciples. They don't look like people have done what they sent out to do. They look scared. They look nervous. They look worried. They don't even know if Jesus is going to be there. If John the Baptist could be killed suddenly... Is Herod going to go after Jesus too? Are they walking back into a trap? Is there going to be a detachment of soldiers waiting for them? All very legitimate concerns. And so all these disciples, are, they're coming back together, and there is Jesus, and there aren't any Roman soldiers, but there is Jesus, and they gather there, and it had to have been an odd meeting, with some of them that's just wanting to share the great things they've done, and others of them, wait a minute, wait a minute, guys, John's dead! All right? There's got, it's got to have been a very weird moment, this sense of shock. I mean, things got very real in that moment as everyone realizes what has happened. And uh, the gospel set uses this phrase, there was much coming and going. And the, the, what that describes, lots of coming and going on hustle and bustle. Think of the last time that something big happened, right? And, and, and no one knows what to think of it in, in something big, whether it's in here in Milan or whether it's a national thing. And, and you know that way that when something happens and no one's quite sure what to think of it, you go into the grocery store and it takes you longer to talk to people in the grocery store than to actually get your groceries. Because every time you see someone, they want to know what you think. And everyone either has a very strong opinion or people are kind of confused about what... I mean, that, that's what this is being described here. There's this coming and going and hustle and bustle and everyone wants to know, Jesus, what do you think about John the Baptist dying? What do you think about this? I mean, what are you going to do, Jesus? And it's all this coming and going and they just can't even get a moment uh, of peace. And so uh, Jesus takes the disciples and he leads them away. He leads them away, he gets in a boat, he, he tells them, get in the boat and, and we're going to go and we're going to get away from all of this. And, and they leave. And uh, the crowd follows. Right? They, fo they see where he's going and they show up. You ever wonder why 5,000 people showed up at this moment? It's not just because uh, they wanted to hear what Jesus was teaching. They wanted to know how Jesus was going to respond. Like Jesus is leading this reform movement in the Jewish faith in the middle of a very contentious political time. And all these people show up because Jesus' partner, John the Baptist, has been murdered. And they want to know what Jesus is going to do. And so they show up and they're saying, Jesus, what, what are you going to do? It, it, this is a legitimate crisis here. And Jesus has some options. Jesus can uh, turn to the, the zealots, the Sicarii. Um, Judas Iscariot, the Sicarii, probably stands for this double-bladed knife that was used to assassinate Roman soldiers. And so some might have expected Jesus to uh, go terrorist, go full uh, sort of revolutionary, Che Guevara, if you will. Uh, there are others who might have expected him to stop his public ministry to go underground. Maybe uh, he was expected to go complain to the, the governor in Damascus, you know, complain that Herod is, not, uh, Herod is not following the law. Others might have expected him to take up J John's cause to lambast Herod in public. Some might have expected him to disband and go home. I mean, you can't fight the Romans. They just, you saw what they just did to John. Might as well just pack up and go home. I'm sure that these were all on the minds of the disciples, and, and some of them were confused, and some of them had strong opinions, and Judas wants them to go uh, revolutionary, and Peter wants to wait and understand, and, and let's say John wants to slow down and figure out what's happening. I mean, we have all this hustle and bustle. They're all confused. They're all talking all at once, and uh, all these people are showing up, and, and the disciples turn to Jesus, and they say, send these folks away. Right? It's, it's an imperative. There's an exclamation mark there. Send these folks away. We have them 
important matters to discuss. Get rid of these people, Jesus. We need to talk about what we're going to do. And Jesus looks at them and he uses an imperative right back at them. Give them something to eat. Well, well, how are we going to do that, Jesus? You got some bread? Well, well, yeah. Start feeding them. And he takes the bread and he breaks it and he blesses it and he gives it. This is what they do. Right? It took me a while to realize Jesus is going to respond to what Herod does and it is Jesus' response to Herod is to take bread and to bless it and to break it and to give it. it is not, he's not buying time so that he can figure out a response. Jesus' response is to take bread, to break it, to bless it, and to give it. The meal is the response. Herod has had his feast, his symposio, his drinking party, and has led to death. Right? Jesus has his meal in response. He gathers people, and he gathers, he has his own banquet, and it is a banquet where there is abundance and there is hope, and where instead of it leading to death, it leads to hope and life and joy, right? Herod kills sheep, and Jesus responds by feeding them. That is, is Jesus' response. As I was reading this, that G, about how Jesus' response to, to Herod is to have this meal, this party, this, this gathering, it, I remembered a moment years ago, it's seven years ago now, give or take, um, I was reading an article of Sojourners. Have you all ever heard of this group, Sojourners, out of Washington, D.C.? They're a very weird duck. They are, they are an evangelical, politically active, progressive Christian group. It's like the hippies of the 60s got Jesus, went to D.C., and stayed. And they've, for 30 years now, 40 years now, they've been there, and they've been advocating for things like debt relief for third world countries that are crippled by these huge debts where they can't fund the education of their children because they're sending all the money overseas to Europe and America. They, uh, I, I appreciate Sojourners because in reading how they articulate things, they talk about abortion, and they'll say abortion is always ugly. And so we should support single mothers because that's the reason a lot of women get abortions is because they're afraid they won't be able to support the kid. So if you, if you want to stop abortions in America, support the mothers. Make sure that they can be mothers, right? And so they, they say things like that. A, a common, if you want to find a common ground, seek a higher ground. Figure out something we can all agree on and, and push towards that. And, and so I, I respect sojourners. I don't always agree with them, but I don't always agree with my wife. So no surprise. Uh, but I was reading an article by sojourners talking about something they had tried in, in Washington, D.C., and it had failed. They had put everything behind the, this effort, and it had just flat failed. And, and so their response, they threw a party. They threw a party. I try to look up the details, but if you go on a website that talks about politics and you look up the word party, well, it <laughs> can't really narrow that down very well. So I don't remember exactly what, what it was that happened, but I, it, it was the party that matters because they, they responded to disappointment and defeat in this problem by throwing a party. And I remember at the time thinking, you wasted all that time and, and those resources you could have been writing letters, calling congressmen, lobbying. Uh, you could have been writing. You could have been getting involved. You could have been hitting the phones. There are all these things you could have been doing to try to handle this political defeat that you've been handed. And instead, you're going to have a party? You know what I sound like right there? The disciples, right? Who are looking at Jesus and saying, send all these people away. We've got to figure out, are we going to go underground? Are we going to go rogue? Are we going to, are we, what are we going to do? Let's talk about practicality, Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Give them something to eat, right? Have a party. And that's what Sojourners did. And it, for years, I thought it was the stupidest thing I had read of any politically active group doing. I just thought it was crazy. And then this week, I'm reading this, and I thought, well, Jesus did it. What's going on there? And I sat down with, with my cup of tea and a pen and paper, because that's how I think, and I, I started thinking, what, what did Jesus do? In the face of tragedy, in the face of a real problem, Jesus didn't start responding to the problem until he sat down and had a gathering to remind people and have people experience what was good. Right? And you can't respond to what is broken and evil in the way that Jesus is laying this out until you start by being reminded what is good. 
You don't deal with evil until you have an experience of holiness, of wholeness, of coming together, taking bread, blessing it, breaking it, and having this meal. Right? I'm sure that Jesus goes on to talk with his disciples about what they're going to do. I'm, I, I know that sojourners went on and, and talked about what they would do, but first they had this meal, they had this party, because the first job of the church is to be the church. Right? The first job of the church is to be the church, to gather in the name of Jesus, to, to come together, to break bread, to bless it, to spend time eating together, and instead of responding to all the anxiety that can suck the joy out of us, to instead have this meal. When the going gets tough, we have a potluck, right? That, that's what we do. When the going gets tough, we have a potluck. When John the Baptist dies, Jesus gets out the slow cooker. Not literally, but you get my point, right? That it's what we still do today, right? If when someone dies, what do we do? Right after the funeral, we get together and have a funeral dinner, right? You ever been to a funeral dinner that's before the funeral? It happens every once in a while, right? And, and it feels awkward, doesn't it? It feels awkward and stilted and weird. It, and I don't like it. I, can, I, I hope families don't do that whenever possible because what, what's a funeral dinner like after the funeral, right? There's this moment of the funeral, you are broken, like someone who's part of your life is gone. And what is the best response to having someone being gone, someone being missing, this experience of being broken? You get together with, with, with the rest of the church, you take bread, you bless it, you break it, and you have an experience of wholeness. You have an experience of holiness. You have an experience of the body of Christ. We respond to brokenness by getting together and being whole, gathered in the name of Jesus. All right. That's uh, the first job of the church is to be the church. That's what, we, that's what Jesus does here. And, and so I'm going to invite you to uh, hold me to this because Lord knows I'm just like the disciples. I want to make a to-do list. I want, I want a bulleted let list of options with pros and cons. Next time we hit a problem as a church and it seems like a big problem and I start talking about options, please look at me and say, Andy, first we have to potluck. All right? Can you do that? And, set, and let, let's try something for each other, too. Next time you get bad news, next time you see, seem overwhelmed, next time something is broken and you just don't know what to do, can you look at each other and say, you need to go have dinner with some people? Right? You can't begin to handle what's broken until you have an experience of gathering and being reminded of what is whole, what is healthy, what is wonderful. When, something, when, when life gives you bad news, potluck. Get together, gather in the name of Jesus. Our first response to the pain of this world is to cook up the tastiest thing we can find and to be the church. Amen. We now come to a time when we have not done that.